Yeah, hello and welcome to uh, the talk from Frank and me uh, regarding threat modeling and beyond for Cisco ACI. And uh, yeah, normally you start with the motivation, thanks to Enno, it's already just uh, this, uh, explained why we want to approach um, and why we came to the idea to approach Cisco and especially ACI. Um, to uh, keep this also in back, just to perform security research and put it public, you should keep in mind this appliance to just get a basic setup is very expensive. It's also a very hard disadvantage. That's also one of the reasons that we want to, to participate and offer our knowledge and insight that we already got regarding this technology to the community. So um, before we will start, I uh, will give you a rough introduction to myself. So who am I? I'm Jan. I'm a security uh, consultant at ERNW. Formerly, I was working so like a security analyst, pen tester, or sometimes I say web app monkey to pen test web application. Did my master degree at the TU Darmstadt. And by now, my focus is mainly at orchestration solution. And also, further on, I'm very interested in red teaming and social engineering. It's, it's also some of my, I like to trick some people, so <laughs> it's also part of what I like. And uh, yeah, my other colleague is uh, Frank. Frank. Hi, my name is Frank. I'm in the IT security business now for 10 years now, I think. And I'm um, yeah, mainly interested in having fun doing pen testing incident analysis, so hunting, uh, hacking stuff and hunting hackers. That's it. Thanks, Frank. So, um, what do we actually have today on our agenda? As Anna already discussed, we will just um, give a, a technical overview and a deep dive. As we start with an introduction to Cisco ACI. What the fuck? What is Cisco ACI? Probably you don't know or have just heard about it, but we want to have an overview of the technology stack and the thoughts behind and the concepts. So then afterwards, we performed some threat modeling on Cisco ACI, which I will um, um, show some details and re results of it to you. Then um, some of these threats, I will uh, explain a bit further. And um, afterwards, Frank will cover a technical attack surface overview of the Cisco ACI appliance. OK, let's have a start. Cisco ACI. Um, just imagine. Cisco ACI is just uh, a spine leaf uh, conversion. It's on the physical layer, um, the representation, how you should start and build your setup, literally. Um, on, the, on the backbone or on the spine area, you have uh, huge switches, and, and then you have the leaf switches. It's that way interconnected that the leaf switches are used to connect all these different components that you want to um, um, connect to each other and managed by Cisco ACI. And the communication is handled and, and forwarded over the spine area. So that in case of error and one machine um, crashes, so you have always a fallback. So it's equal load balancing established and so on. Um, and on the other side, we have um, the, the EPIC, this is the Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, which is just connected to the leaf. I will um, give you more insights regarding these components in a few seconds. So to uh, continue the technical overview, um, how it will be look like in the reality. So for example, you have your, 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 your leaf switches here. And below, you have the DMZ and the internal core and the storage area or even the virtualization. Uh, with Cisco ACI, we have the opportunity to connect our virtual appliances or hypervisor stack, open stack, so on, to this um, technology. Um, if you look into these systems, what do you actually have? We have a dedicated operating system um, that is used by the application policy infrastructure controller. That is just a, a single uh, appliance on the right side. And then we have the spine and leaf switches, which are just the Nexus 9000, or the 9K switches, how you say it, um, which are controlled by this policy controller. Um, to keep uh, in back, why is Cisco just approaching um, this, this market and, and just new appliance? Um, it's kind of the market challenger for uh, VM, VMware NSX. 
um, Cisco ACI. ACI is just an acronym for uh, application-centric infrastructure. And the idea behind this is to um, offer something like a micro-segmentation solution that you can trigger from your developer perspective or for, from, from the upside to um, quickly establish changes and just connect application to each other that should be uh, on a micro segmentation level. Um, just imagine we have a follow firewall change that should be applied for our application. We want to have a hotfix that takes hours or days just in the real world. And uh, the micro segmentation approach and the um, Cisco ACI approach is just to um, segment the application on an application layer level so that you have only segments where single application can communicate to each other and nothing more. Um, just to, to keep it in, in, in the view, you want to focus on it to have uh, yeah, just a micro segmentation. Um, at the back end, there, uh, to, to, there is use the technology um, to transport the traffic from one spine switch to another spine switch, uh, uh, leaf switch, sorry. Um, and at the back end, there is uh, VXLAN used to have an overlay um, on layer three that you can transport layer two packages. Uh, thanks to Hen Henrik, his talk from yesterday, where he just covered up some security details regarding VXLAN, and for sure, this will also be an interesting topic for him to search in. Um, during our um, setup phase of our setup, Henrik already come to ERNW, and we had some time to investigate into him, so because of some, yes, hey, it's Henrik. Um, yeah, that we had some, some issues with the setup, and so it was yeah, delayed, anyhow. Um, further on, um, what do we all know actually regarding this appliance? Um, if you look on the website of Cisco, um, they have these shiny certificates on this website, like a FIPS or a PCI DSS or common criteria, but if you dig deeper into the details, uh, what actually has been certified, you realize Okay, it's just more like we have an availability feature which is covered by the certificate, but uh, a real statement regarding the overall system security is yeah, not really stated in such. Even from the ESG group, the, um, the security test was not uh, very explained. So anyhow, um, so we, we, we have to dig deeper and it's just, have, it's, it's just good to have a certificate, but it does not say that much regarding security. Back to the architecture. I mentioned we have the spine leaf hierarchical architecture and this application policy infrastructure controller. From an operator perspective or from, from an ops per, per, uh, perspective, if you want to control and establish and configure the system, every single configuration is sent to the application policy infrastructure controller, and um, from there, um, the, the configuration is just, it's just a policy that is pushed to the switches. So you define the state of the network that you want to have, and uh, the switches apply these. Under the hood, they use uh, an overlay transport visualization and virtual tunneling endpoints. So each component um, that you're connected to this network can be segmented into endpoint groups. So we, we are just talking about kind of endpoint. An endpoint can be everything that has an Ethernet connection and can be freely configured um, in the ACI setup. Um, all, all devices that should be in, in the traditional way connected together are put in an endpoint group. Such endpoint groups can be spanned over multiple uh, leaf switches. Um, internally, it's routed over uh, the overlay network, so it looks from application perspective like it's um, in the same network. So, and if you want to have an interconnection between those endpoint groups, Cisco ACI offers you it's called contracts. So if you want to inter-e uh, application policy group connection from one to another, you can establish a contract. That's something like a stateless um, firewall that's uh, a, a, a whitelisting approach on up to layer four, uh, la la layer four, sorry. Um, as I mentioned, layer, layer up to layer four, 
And in case of that you want to um, integrate, for example, your network appliance or your application gateway or, or load balancer appliance that you have in physical there, um, Cisco ACI offers you and it's extensible uh, extension probability for have layer four up to seven integration so that the traffic from one network, from one endpoint group one to endpoint group two is sent outside to an external appliance again back into this setup. Um, furthermore, if you want to configure and push configuration into the um, application policy infrastructure controller, you um, have schemes like authentication, authorization, and even accounting in place, and a role-based access control that's interconnected with LDAP, or even just you can manage it by Active Directory, Radius, and so on. Um, yeah, as just said, the application policy infrastructure controller is just um, the location where the policies are maintained, and it offers you also a REST API. So uh, um, you can use uh, this appliance in combination with a hypervisor, KVM, or you can uh, integrate it into an, an open stack. And if as soon the application is spin up and you configure your database connection from one um, appliance to another, you can specify it there, and the integration into OpenStack enables you to push also the configuration to the EPIC and from the EPIC into the infrastructure. So you are highly flexible to interconnect uh, and design your network. Um, as a, a short side note for here, um, one overall setup from a spine, a leaf, and a, a, an EPIC, it's normally called also a fabric. That's, that's just another phrase, just another term for this. Yeah, and just imagine um, if we have something like a contract filter, you have from one APG to another, we have the ARP traffic for sure, the IP traffic, or here even the trill, the, the, the management protocol, and you can specify in the contract just only to allow HTTP or HTTPS. But by now, remember, we are just stateless. If you want to be stateful, you can even apply a next-gen firewall, something like this, and with the overall integration. Mm. So we, we, we got now an idea of, of the physical and um, conceptual components that we are having in place, and, and, and now you're getting it so, so, uh, soon. Uh, we have a very complex system. Um, no, so we want to try um, to perform threat modeling against this. Just a short recap. Threat modeling was initially designed by Microsoft or, and, and proposed in, in, in about 2003. And yes, it's just uh, one approach. We used Thrite to, to perform threat modeling. And, and yeah, Thrite was more from an application view. If you want to, the, the threat models and, and the threats that actually used by Thrite um, in networking scheme, it's, it's just, yeah, you can try it, but uh, it's not that easy to achieve. For example, tempering a, a local device is yeah, just, just hard to establish. So we, we, we proposed some, some extension, for example, from, from a network perspective, we want to, uh, threat modeling that also includes sniffing, and sniffing is initially not especially included in, in, the, in the classical threat model. So um, then we started, oh, sorry, wait. We started um, our, our search in the internet and, and looked for potential sources for, for definition of threat in the network. And, and soon you're getting to ISO uh, 27000 series and then find there a, a proposal of different kind of threats. And even the NIST offers interesting uh, threat collect collections. You can, can, can get in touch. I will give you with the sources if you are interested. And, and even Cisco with, with his books, Routing Security Strategies, and so on. So we propose, based on this, just a, just a slightly motiv uh, modification to perform threat modeling also on the network area. So not for all uh, possible threats, we, we use Stride, we, um, we have for the network cases just um, the modification so that we go for tempering will be rephrased into interception 
And elevation of privileges on the network layer, we, you do not have uh, elevation of privilege. This is more, okay, from network perspective, it's more like an unauthorized access. So we have for network uh, threat modeling, this is just the move. And on the network layer, we have repudiation. It's, it's also not that, that, that good fitting. And in new category for sure sniffing. So if we, if we just uh, overlook it, what kind of changes have we made? So we have the spoofing, spoofing is still preserved. Then um, tempering is rephrased into um, interception. And info, info, info disclosure stays, denial of service also. Um, yeah, <clears throat> um, elevation of privileges, we changed to unauthorized access. And at the end, we, we got a new kind of threat that we called just sniffing. So, and, and with all this information and sources, you, you start uh, approaching and looking into the conceptual thought that the application or the, the designers of Cisco ACCI met. So you have different kind of possible threats that you will have on an ACI setup. So you have, for example, the, the VX overlay and there's a breakout or the comp compromise of switch, spoofing and so on. And in the next steps, I want to dig deeper in three different kinds of uh, threats that I uh, will just give you the scenario and uh, the threat and, and possible counter message at this location. Okay, from Cisco ACI uh, perspective, you have different kind of um, filter mechanism in place. It means, okay, every uh, component on the network side is just um, at the, in, in the different endpoint groups at the leaf switches. So, and if you have the opportunity to inject traffic into another VLAN, a VXLAN, you, you get uh, tremendous problems because you have different security assumption on the different uh, network and in, a, and in a different VXLAN. Further problem would be if you have the opportunity to bypass such mechanism, you can maybe talk to another endpoint group or even um, if you're capable, you are um, bypassing the um, external appliances, what I just mentioned for layer four up to seven, if you have there uh, like a web application firewall appliance anyway, anything like this, um, you can bypass it. So you, you have uh, just a threat that we have maybe an unauthorized access or even an information disclosure. This is the result of this. And um, if you want uh, just um, countermeasures for such kinds of attacks, you're just in a kind of hard situation. So you can go for traditional switch hardening in, in the classical area, it's just limited because we have now um, only the, uh, the, the EPICS application policy infrastructure controller where you define your network so you, you can configure it in the best will but you have just uh, um, a limited possibility to, 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 to just perform hardening, but so on. Um, you, you can just put it there. Furthermore, if you have um, a very different kind of um, classification of your data that you actually process and want to be very sure, you have to establish at least multiple fabrics. Um, and the another thing is that we will always go for a recommendation, um, establish just uh, uh, leverage the monitoring capabilities of this uh, infrastructure and look out for anomalies in this network. Um, further on, um, the next step would be uh, that you have a VTAP uh, spoofing. Means, okay, the attacker is in a position where he is capable to inject traffic and spoof traffic at the virtual tunneling endpoint. This means he gets access to the VXLAN overlay and is capable to inject in different uh, VXLANs. So the threat at this is you have a kind of unauthorized access, possible denial of service because you can just announce a VTAP at some switch and the other did not realize that um, the traffic is now there and so maybe you have, you have a black holing and, and the traffic will never receive the end so it's just uh, denial of service or even uh, capable to intercept the traffic uh, and manipulate it probably. To perform hardening against this, so what kind of probabilities do we have there? Just also switch hardening but in kind of, we can establish a first hop security um, first of security, um, for the control plane network, we would recommend to say, okay, we have dedicated ports and dedicated uh, network where only the control traffic is um, transported 
or even just on the physical isolation. You should be ensure and, 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 and uh, make it clear that no one has the capability to inject traffic between spinal leaf switches or even in the control plane. So, so there would be it, it very important to have, uh, it, it is hardening that you have no dedicated access, uh, no access to the data plane or even to the physical uh, isolation of the switches. And for sure, in this case, we need the monitoring and, 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 and anomaly detection that will be an advantage. Um, the third threat I want to um, some more explain is just, uh, just the, an attacker has a probability and, and the scenario and, and compromise a switch. What, what actually does an, an attacker that compromises a switch can do from this perspective? He can, for example, manipulate the control plane or just uh, define um, endpoint group discovery. This means we have the threat of an unauthorized access to, to, to data and endpoints that's not intended, or even the denial of service, interception, and information disclosure is in place. Um, how can it be insured? What kind of um, an intruder uh, like um, attack vectors we will have on this layer, on these switches, is just, um, you, you, you have just the management part to attack actually a switch. So just what could you can do is restrict the configuration, the accessibility to such management ports. And to be uh, ensure that the threat that I just listed cannot be exploited for highly sensitive uh, systems. I would go for, or it would be the, the recommended way to say, okay, we go by classical network um, separation and spin up a new network. And for sure, in this case, also um, monitoring the network and, 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 and looking for anomalies. So since all the security probabilities we have are just restricted for monitoring and the, the capabilities of hiring this infrastructure by goodwill trust in the um, security configuration of the appliances. So in this case, it, it should be, uh, ident uh, you can see that um, the monitoring of your network is very important. So, and in the next step, we will go in a technical surface overview, and this will be done by Frank. Thank you. So, let's have a look at some of the components that we had to look out uh, at. So, beginning with the management interface of the APIC, uh, that was one of the first components that we looked at. Um, there's a separate uh, physical interface, which is called in this uh, um, case an out of band management interface. And when you're looking for the IPv4 connectivity, then you can see that um, there are two services offered. So there are some IP tables rules active on the APIC that uh, prevent you from uh, reaching any other services. But if you're looking for the IP IPv6 uh, connectivities, um, you can see that you are, with, uh, IP, with, a link, with a link local address, able to reach, um, in theory, every service that is offered um, on this interface. Uh, we found two more services in this case. This is not anymore the, um, with the newest version. This is not anymore the case. They fixed it with version 4.2. So if you have an up-to-date APIC, that should be no problem for you. But otherwise, there might be some more ports open to the at least local area. We will talk about those services in a second. So the first service that we had a look at is um, the SSH service. Um, it's called ISSHD uh, on the APIC. Uh, it's a special daemon that is uh, from the size um, 3.5 times larger than the normal SSH daemon. So there's probably some uh, weird functionality in there or something custom. Um, when you're connecting to the SSH service, you are put, you're getting put into a uh, change rooted environment. So you have no um, access to all of the files on the APIC in default. Um, from the PS3 output over here, you might see that um, there's also a script container started when you connect to the SSH daemon. Um, this one is a set UID binary, which will uh, put you in the change root environment and drop its privileges. So this is more or less the component that's responsible for this environment. Um, and normally in the beginning you have a special admin account that you can use to in, order, in order to administrate the APIC. And this account uh, does not show up in the past video or in the shadow file. Um, this is because there's a, a custom PAM module that they have built. And this is probably responsible for giving the admin user access to this device. And there's also a hard-coded file in this library, which uh, references the, uh, the file that is containing the password for the admin account. 
Um, so, and in general, what the SSH uh, service is for is um, at least um, for the old school Cisco guys, a possibility to configure the Cisco in an old school way. So the old conf T uh, is available. And how this is implemented is a bit different than from the old school ways because there's no Cisco IOS. This is, it's a Linux system. So in order to have this um, old feeling of the Cisco shell, they built an application, a web application, and a new WSGI application. Uh, which is, uh, WSGI is uh, just a um, software stack that is provide, uh, that's hosting services. So it is, in this case, it's a Python web application that is running there. So if you, for example, press the question mark, um, there will be in the back end an HTTP request to the application and a new WSGI request. And the response will then be printed out to the command line. The same goes when you're entering commands. There's an endpoint, in this case, it's called cmd.cli, which is processing the commands. Uh, there's also something for tap. And if you're entering a command that is not recognized, um, yeah, you might get an, ex uh, an exact trace. So this is something that could be interesting. Uh, we also found some challenge response functionality. So there's a file with a uh, constantly changing string in it, uh, which is probably or maybe used for some challenge response functionality. This string is also um, contained in the library, which is implementing the PAM functionality. And this library is also included in the SSH daemon and in the NGINX, so the web server that's running our system. So they might use this functionality. Um, the NGINX itself, so the web server which is offering the GUI, the uh, GUI for the management of the APIC, um, has uh, quite some location, some um, endpoints configured in its configuration file. So there are, for example, the API um, that is off, uh, the REST API that is offered by the NGINX is uh, included in there, but also some locally listening services that uh, mo well, um, why most of them are running as root and the Nginx itself. So those are maybe also interesting. Uh, the REST API is available via slash API. Um, and the REST API is more or less the main component for configuring the API at APIC. So the GUI, the web GUI, the web application, and the SSH uh, access are all more or less built on the REST API. So if you are using them, you are in the back end using the REST API. This is mainly um, has been built in order to also give you the opportunity to make some automation. So it's um, possible to get a token um, um, and do some automation with scripts. But it can also, for, of course, uh, be used for hacking. There's also a nice tracer built in into the web application. So you can enable it with, within the GUI. Then you get a, a window like this. And then you can see here the requests and the responses which are being made in the GUI in, uh, and are sent in the backend. So you don't need a burp or anything like that. So you can just uh, enable the tracer, and you will see what is going on in the backend. Another functionality that is offered by the GUI is um, the device packages, uh, or more or less, um, the, uh, the layer 4 uh, to layer seam services integration. So in theory, uh, as um, Jan already told, it's possible to integrate multiple devices, like SSL offloaders, um, load balancers, uh, firewalls. And to ease the, uh, the, um, the task a little bit up um, to integrate them, um, it is possible to import a so-called device package, uh, which normally will be offered by the vendor, containing some code and information about the device. So if a vendor provides a layer 4 to a layer seam device, you can grab maybe or hopefully a device package from the vendor, import it, and then maybe the device is already magically going to work. Um, a device package is not really more than just a zip file containing at least one XML file with some definitions and some Python scripts. And as soon as the, the device package is imported, it will be unpacked and um, the Python uh, scripts uh, being executed. So this is maybe also something that someone could look into. Um, there was also a service called Appliance Director, at least from the file name. Um, it's running on this port. Um, we not yet have seen any con uh, communication with the service, so we are not quite sure what it's really doing. Um, it's at least uh, using TLS with client certificates, so we are at the moment still trying to get our hands on some uh, client certificates, but as far as now, we don't know yet what this service is really doing. The other service which was available from the IPv6 link local address was uh, a C-Sync um, 2 service. So this is a more or less just like an rsync for multiple hosts. So in order to keep files in sync on multiple hosts, this protocol, uh, this tool and the protocol can be used. The protocol itself is pretty straightforward. It's a text-based protocol um, that can easily be understood by just looking at it. 
we'll see a, a, an example in a few seconds. And the protocol basically uh, enables you to uh, keep files in sync. It also can, um, the program itself uh, is able to use a password in order to um, at least a little bit protect the communication. And uh, this password is sent over uh, in as is, and if noise is in place in clear text over the wire. So what does this look like? We have here a little uh, Moya shark dump from this protocol. As you can see here, hopefully you can see also in the back, are the, uh, the left side, the red, um, red marked uh, lines are the one from the client, the blue ones from the server, so that those are the responses. You begin with a config and a hello, so a little bit similar to SMTP. And then you have some commands like list and sick, which can be used to either list the files that are on the server and maybe have been changed. You can use sick in order to request um, a hash sum, for example, for a file in order to verify whether or not the file has been changed. And sick can also be used, for example, to do some sort of um, an, uh, final, uh, disk, um, directory enumeration and file enumeration. So depending on the response that you are getting from a specific path, you will get either permission denied in the case of a uh, path that is not available or some sort of data coming back if, you know, for cases where there is actually some data. And the black marked lines are obviously the password, which is in this case just sent as is, not hash, not nothing, just send as is. This is not an issue from Cisco itself. It's a, oh, depending on whether or not it's really an issue. Uh, it's uh, implemented as um, similar to the uh, source code over here. So it's publicly available. Um, the project is still available. Okay, let's now have a look at uh, the leaf switches, or at least in the direction of the leaf switches. Um, in order to be able to configure the leaf switches, um, there's an, at least one protocol that is used. It's OpFlex control protocol. Um, it's uh, more or less just JSON with some RPC methods that um, are based on JSON RPC version one. And this protocol is also an um, IETF draft from April 2016. And so far, at least depending on the combination we have seen so far, they are pretty, um, they are pretty conform with the um, standard. And this protocol uh, enables you at least, or should enable you to apply more or less a configuration on the leaf switches. There are several methods um, configured, um, predefined. So for example, there's an echo, like a ping, uh, with some parameters that are expected to be sent. And uh, the, uh, the, the sender uh, uh, expects the same parameters back with the echo. There's a send identity method, which can be used, for example, to gather uh, more peers. So if um, the, the receiver of the message knows about more peers, he will probably send some more connectivity informations, uh, in this case IP addresses, of other APIC, for example, APIC instances. So you might get more targets. And there's the method policy update, which is uh, in theory being used uh, to push the policy uh, on, on all the switches. We have not seen yet the communication for that. But at least for, depending on the draft, this is something that will be probably be done that way. And um, when uh, listening to Henrik's talk yesterday, when he talked about VXLAN and the RFC, and he tried to find some mentioning of uh, security, we uh, uh, were smiling because we did the same with this draft. And uh, there were at least four mentionings of security, one in the agenda, one in the references, and those two. And those two um, basically say there is no security. So it's, uh, there's no integrity, no privacy, no authentication. And what they are suggesting is if you want some security, you should use TLS. And um, yeah, maybe then everything is fine or not. Um, the OpFlex service, which is uh, responsible for processing the OpFlex protocol, um, is at least speaking TLS. The service is accessible in the management network and for convenience reasons also again running as root. Um, so that's it for the technical part. The next steps now, um, we are now still looking more into the protocols because those are from our point of view the most interesting ones. Uh, we definitely have a closer look on the device packages and yeah, getting remote root is always a good idea. Some security considerations. So um, as uh, ACI is a co very complex t uh, topic, we can't give you the uh, right solution to secure it, but uh, some things that I want to keep in mind are Restrict the access to the management interface, obviously. Uh, network mon monitoring might be a good idea, especially on those uh, areas where uh, security measures can't be easily implemented or there's no option to do that. Um, you should frequently look out for update, uh, updates because in the last few months there were quite some updates, so there will be probably in the future also some. 
And uh, yeah, you shouldn't import device packages that you have got from spam, 4chan, or Stack Overflow directly on your APIC. And yeah, that's it. Questions? Thank you very much. Well, are there any questions? We are a bit behind schedule, so I will allow like two or three questions. Just enough for me then. <laughs> <laughs> um, were you able to talk to the leaf switches directly? Um, e yes. Okay, so you could uh, actually perform changes on the leaf switches? Not yet. Okay, from your PC. Come again? From your PC, from your attacker PC. I can't go into detail in, on this part, sadly. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Other questions? Okay, I said I would allow like two questions, so maybe I shouldn't have told that. People are afraid right now. Well, there were two questions, so. I was just worried that we were running out of time. Um, I, was, uh, I keep seeing people now using uh, software defined SD WANs with Cisco, you know, uh, especially recently purchasing Viptela. Is this in any relation to Viptela implementations? Would I see that there as well? Like if I know people using Viptela, would they, could I point at this? Or are these totally different realms to look at? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure. It's a totally different thing. Uh, this is Okay, yes, there weren't any questions <laughs> anyways, or uh, I frightened people too much. Okay, thank you again.